the global electric mobility mega trend is on the rise. It's on the rise in India too, but the industry volumes are far from the critical mark yet. There are incentives which are very important for uh, the better rate of adoption of electric vehicles. But what is more critical is a favorable ecosystem, a robust supply chain, a robust localized supply supply chain rather for EV ecosystems, for EV components and systems. So uh, to discuss uh, this topic, uh, we, I have with me uh, Suraj Shetty, uh, who is the principal research analyst in the automotive supply chain and technology team at IHS Market. Uh, Suraj, good to have this chat with you. Thank you, Samantha. Good to be here. <laughs> okay, uh, let's start off by talking about uh, you know the current situation where we are, the current uh, EV industry status, and uh, what are the growth projections uh, uh, according to IHS market uh, globally and more importantly uh, in the Indian context for the Indian sure. industry. Sure, sure. First of all, you know when we talk about electrification or electric mobility. You know, it's, it's very important to actually read between the lines and cut the clutter when it comes to the jargon. You know, a lot of uh, OEMs actually announced that they plan to electrify most of their uh, model range. But when we, they say that, it actually means everything from mild hybrids to pure battery electric vehicles, the entire gamut. So it's, it's very important to actually read between the lines when we actually read headlines like that, you know, because the technology, it has technology implications. And, uh, you know, uh, now, when we look at the overall global volumes, uh, uh, say 2019 to 2026, the overall light vehicle volumes are not sort of ex expected to expand or explode exponentially. In 2019, it was uh, a shade uh, near 90 million, and uh, it's not exp it it's a shade below say 100 million uh, by 2026. But what's very interesting is the rise of electric electric uh, technology. You know. Uh, for example, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, you know, globally, the share of uh, ICE or, and ICE start stop vehicles is expected to decline from 81 million units in 2019 to 48 million units in 2026. And uh, what gains from this uh, drop is uh, electric mobility. Uh, and uh, we see a snapshot of that. Uh, we see a sort of a snapshot of that, uh, especially in 2020, in a very difficult year. Uh, where the demand for vehicles where, with conventional internal combustion engine vehicles fell by 21% from 2019 to 2020. The same period, electrified vehicle demand grew by 36%. You know, so it's it's a very encouraging sign. The market is uh, gaining traction. Uh, certain more mature markets are sh sh showing sign of very high acceptability of these vehicles. Uh, now, In the India context? Uh, the Indian story, let's... Uh, to sort of come to the Indian story, the current numbers are not very high, overall numbers. For example, in 2020, it was around the 5,000 mark, the vehicle production, uh, not, not, you know, something to tout about, but, uh, you know. And, uh, and for the benefit of the viewers, here we are talking about uh, four-wheeler electric vehicles. Yes, yes. Uh, just to make it clear, it's all light vehicle numbers, what we're talking about, you know. Uh, the game is very different when it comes to two-wheelers and uh, three-wheelers. Uh, the tech, yeah. But in India, our projections show that one out of four light vehicles produced in 2030 is expected to for leverage some form of alternative power, powertrain technology, you know, and uh, BV production in India is expected to grow at a very impressive percent CAGR between 2020 to 2030. So that uh, gives you the answer that, you know, the future is bright. Uh, at the moment, the volumes are not there, but they're expected to grow uh, pretty strongly. And for them, for the volumes to grow at a fairly uh, good rate, and more importantly, the yeah. uh, over at the average uh, price of an EV to come down uh, to more affordable levels, especially in a price sensitive market like India, localization is extremely key, right? And uh, so, from that context, if you if you were to look at the technology trends, or uh, let's say uh, the technology uh, roadmap. Uh, both uh, 
you know, globally and in India. Why ask globally? Because IHS market you know, tracks markets uh, you know, globally. So from true. that context, you know, what are the trends that you see and uh, what are the advantages and what, is the, what are the opportunities that are there uh, in India for, let's say, you know, the uh, component industry to really uh, tap? So uh, when we talk about electric vehicles, uh, battery electric vehicle, let's, let's focus on that and hybrid electric vehicles to a certain extent. There are three key components uh, or three modules which we are we talk about when it comes to the supply chain. It's the batteries, it's the e-motors, electric motors, and the power electronic side of things, the inverters, converters, etc. So let me start off with the with the battery, you know, because that's what sort of dominates the consciousness anyway. Everybody is really keen and interested to know about what's happening. Now here, this is sort of common knowledge. It's the lithium ion battery, which, which will continue to be the dominant type, you know, and when we talk about lithium ion batteries globally, there are two major chemistries, uh, which is the M NMC, which is a nickel manganese cobalt and the LFP, which is a lithium ion phosphate, right? And, uh, if you look at what dominates globally, the demand, it is the NMC, which dominates the demand globally. And uh, in NMC, globally, if you look at it, uh, there is a trend of reducing the cobalt content in the in, in the NMC uh, NMC chemistry. And the reason this is so is that uh, this is a this is a technology trend. And the reason this is happening is because cobalt is expensive. So you know, if you reduce the content of cobalt, the cost of cells and equivalently the cost of the of the vehicle and the battery sort of drops, making it more affordable. Which is one of the key is the key driving points for increased acceptance because electric vehicles to an equivalent ice is more expensive. Right? And uh, there are also some ethical mining concerns with cobalt, but let's not get into that. <laughs> no. And uh, so, But when cobalt content sort of reduces, if you drop the cobalt content, the battery cell capacity per cell also drops. Uh, so it's a sort of a trade-off. Uh, now in India, NMC is not majorly used in India. Uh, Simple fact is it's expensive. India is a not a cost, but a more of a value sensitive market is what I like to call it, you know, and uh, but cobalt adds to the thermal stability of the cell. So you cannot completely eliminate cobalt at the moment, but research is ongoing for alternatives to cobalt in uh, NMC uh, uh, chemistry. Now, another approach which is sort of gaining acceptance now is the addition of aluminum while the cobalt content is reducing and that chemistry CA. Uh, the NMC is nickel, manganese, cobalt, and aluminum uh, along with it. And, uh, you know, the Ultium, uh, Ultium uh, cells, which was developed uh, by the joint venture between LG Energy Solutions and uh, General Motors is an example of this kind of chemistry. Uh, and uh, now going on to lithium ion phosphate or the LFP, uh, this chemistry is less expensive, more thermally stable, but it has a lower cell voltage. Uh, so to get an equivalent range uh, of an NMC, you will need to use a larger pack. Uh, and because of the lower cost, this is what is preferred in the Indian market currently. Uh, and the reason for this is very simple because the Indian market design considerations when it comes to an electric vehicle is a little different from a global consideration simply because of the difference in maturity of the markets. So in India, it is the cost as well as a safety, which is would be more of a concern uh, rather than the global consideration where the focus is more on range and performance. You know, uh, now a lot of alternative chemistries, you ask me what is happening in this field. So a lot of the chemistries and variations are being worked on. We, we hear news of some new stuff happening every day. Uh, for example, solid state was all the rage. There's a lot of uh, press around it. It dominates the narrative is supposed to be the next big, big thing. But uh, it has still not made the transition to real world mass manufacturing setting. So, you know, definitely it will be the next game changer, hopefully. But uh, uh, projections in terms of volumes, etc. will be a little premature at the moment. Right. right. Yeah. Now, just to give you a snapshot of uh, what might be the trend when it comes to the Indian supply in, uh, in the batteries. Uh, you know, initially, we were importing the packs itself. But uh, but there but there is a transition which is happening to actually uh, manufacturing the modules and the packs uh, locally while importing the cells and mainly coming from China and Japan. Now, as the volumes increase, the reliance on China is not is expected to sort of increase as the volumes scale up. But the end game in the long term is expected to you know locally produce the cells. There are certain challenges to this. But the PLI scheme, which is an incentive scheme, which was uh, announced, uh, 
is a step in the right direction and is expected to encourage uh, such steps. Indeed, indeed uh, schemes like the uh, PLI uh, would be uh, very critical for the uh, you know, supply chain uh, to yeah. you know, increasingly localize. Uh, well, in the Indian context, what the other thing which comes to uh, my mind is uh, like right now we are in, in the summer, you know, and yeah. uh, India is a is a land of extreme uh, climate, and that also poses a challenge uh, for uh, the you know uh, for EVs, right? Uh, I mean, uh, as I understand, you are you are also a specialist in thermal management. But uh, yes. uh, tell me, yes. you know, uh, what solutions would uh, you know uh, EVs in India need to adopt? To kind of you not know, tackle this uh, challenge, which is you no know, more you know, not kind of you not know, prevalent in you know, uh, India and in India-like countries, uh, you know, globally. True. Uh, now, if you're looking at let let me separate it out because uh, uh, there are two approaches to this. One is the cooling and the heating side of things, and uh, globally, most of the focus is on heating rather than cooling. Yes, the cooling is there. But if you look at the preoccupation of the OEMs and the suppliers, it is more with the heating side of things, of the battery as well as the cabin. Whereas in India, considering, as you said, it's a temperate climate, uh, most of the time the temperatures stay really high for most of the regions, uh, the focus would be on cooling side of things. And uh, if you're looking at the battery, uh, let's, let's look at each component separately. Uh, batteries, uh, you know, the simplest approach would be cooled using the air. But uh, even globally, there is a move away from it, and uh, very the main driving factor between it uh, because of sorry driving it is the increase in the battery pack capacity and the power. You know the average battery pack capacity has gone up quite exponentially globally. So air cooling no longer cuts it, and there is a general move towards liquid based cooling, uh, even globally. They are even experimenting with immersion cooling. You know it's not made the transition to production, but uh, AMG Mercedes uh, solutions are actually experimenting with this. So globally, cooling is sorted because in principle, it's not very different from what you see in internal combustion engines. A few components here and there, additionally, say a chiller. But otherwise, you know, we understand coolant-based cooling. So it's not rocket science for the OEMs over there. So that's sorted. Uh, E-motors and power electronics are the other two components uh, also are moving towards coolant-based. And the reason for this is simple because the motors are getting larger, more powerful. But also there is an increased integration between the two. So you have the you have a move towards e-axles where you know transmission, the, the transmission, the motor as well as the power electronics are being uh, integrated into a single unit. Now, this has a lot of benefits from a design viewpoint, packaging uh, weight, etc., but also from a thermal viewpoint. You, you know, you can you can actually integrate the circuit between the three. So it's it's uh, it has a benefit from that side also. Now, coming to the heating side of things, this is where things are a little uh, interesting globally. You know, the main reason is because uh, when you look at EV heating, uh, their main dependence is on uh, electric heaters. Uh, and electric heaters like PTC heater as well as a resistor wire heater are very power, uh, power hungry. So the impact is 25% to 40% of your range. So, so just to give you a context that at say a place like Canada, where the temperatures can drop to minus 10, minus 50, you have the electric heater blasting all the time, half your range is gone. You know, and this is a major concern. Uh, you know, it, it occupies the mind space. So OEMs and suppliers are obsessed with this, how to reduce the, dip, uh, reduce the dependence on these uh, electric heaters. And the way they're approaching this is by actually integrating all the cooling circuits. So the idea is that wherever you have heat within the circuit, you recover it and you move it around. So any heat in the battery system, for example, can be moved around to use the cabin heating. Similarly, the other way around. So that's that's the approach and that's the preoccupation uh, globally now. But uh, when it comes to India and also, sorry, uh, globally also, they are supporting cabin heating and cabin cooling with, with uh, sort of alternative supporting systems, like for example, uh, seat heating, seat cooling, steering heating. Now they are not as power hungry as uh, say, uh, using a large PTC heater or a, you know, a resistive wire heaters and passengers are comfortable much faster. Another way they're doing this is by, uh, by sort of preheating or preconditioning uh, the battery as well as the cabin while the vehicle is plugged in. So the idea is that you use the power of the grid rather than the vehicle. And uh, you can pre-program this today with the app or, you know, set the time. So say you have to leave at nine o'clock, your vehicle starts up at 8.30 and makes the vehicle nice and toasty before you leave. 
so saves power at the same time you are more comfortable right so so these are all the you know clever little intelligent solutions the global market is using now if you ask do we need all this in india no because you are never going to see minus 10 degrees in majority of the regions here the focus is more on the you're going to see is 45 degrees sweating when you get into the vehicle so you have the ac on full blast you have the battery really at high temperatures and the ev battery works very well in a very narrow temperature band especially the lithium ion it's at 20 to 40 degree sweet spot uh at sub zero temperatures the charge acceptance is is affected which we are not going to see in india but at higher temperatures there is a risk of degrading the battery uh no considering the battery cost replacing one is going to be a challenge uh, not a challenge but a concern so we need to take care of the battery in india in a climate like india so it is cooling which is going to be is a preoccupation for us and frankly if you ask me it's not uh, we already see a move towards uh, cool coolant based systems you know that we see the nexon for example it was locally developed so uh, a very nice application of liquid cooled base system and hopefully the that would be the trend going forward also to take care of the battery cutting corners especially when it comes to thermal is not going to pay off really well in the long term right. i would sort of say right so, yeah, yeah quite a lot of story but uh, yes yes and and you're and, right i think in in a country like india the focus uh, I, i'm sure there'll be developments more developments in the near future also in terms of innovative way you know of uh, cooling and keeping yeah. the, uh, the 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 entire uh, system especially the battery system in an optimum uh, not uh, temperature range uh, and but uh, battery we we focused on battery which is the single most expensive uh, part of an ev component yeah uh, yes but however in totality the ev ecosystem has to be not totally robust for any any uh, uh, country's uh, ev industry to be to have a really sustainable growth and to reach the critical volumes and more so if uh, the country harbors a dream to be among the you know, uh, global leaders uh, which india uh, does so uh, in that scenario what uh, what are the steps what are the approaches you think you know uh, the industry ev industry players should take uh, let's say primarily the tier 1 uh, tier 2 uh to you know to build this uh no much needed uh sustainable very robust uh, ev ecosystem see the as you all already sort of mentioned in the beginning it's it's a it's a game of scale you know uh for any kind of supply chain to sort of flourish and develop or the seeds to be planted it has to be a concentrated effort from both sides so it has to be if you look at what happened in other countries uh, one prime example would be sort of china we had hold that up because they made a very conscious effort of developing a flourishing ecosystem over there and it was a it was a very guided concentrated effort from the from a top down from the government down you know that is what happened but uh, there are lessons to be learned from the market over there but considering the accelerated pace at which we need to catch up now uh all the lessons might not translate or we might not have the luxury of time also now that ev technology sort of developed uh, you know there are certain challenges to that uh, ecosystem supply chain uh, from a global perspective also because see when we are talking about supply chain today we'll have to do locally but think globally right and and for each component it's it's a little different considering the differences in technology uh, as well uh, so just to, sorry just to give you an idea where we are uh, in certain components uh, i i all sort of touched upon what's happening uh, in the indian ecosystem uh, when it comes to batteries uh, you know and uh, already we see some moves happening over there but uh, when it comes to uh, say e motors right we we uh, even though there is a move towards e axles globally we don't see uh, any any such local ecosystem coming up at the moment uh, in india and even when it comes to say power electronics the only sort sort of local player currently is is uh, supplying inverters which is bosch india uh, who supplying to tata when it comes to other components like uh, on board chargers or dc dc converters there are no local indian players uh, so it's it's going to be a challenge frankly uh, so as you already mentioned government incentives are are a step in the right direction it encourages localization and capacity building uh, but what's also interesting is that 
if we draw on lessons from what's happening globally, a uh, lot of these components, like for example, onboard batteries and powertrain components, uh, OEMs who have large scale OEMs like Volkswagen, General Motors, who have a history of manufacturing components in-house, you know, they are actually moving most of the supply chain in-house. So it's not just other suppliers, international suppliers they'll have to compete with. The suppliers and upcoming suppliers will have to compete with the OEMs themselves for the projects. So there has to be, rather than focus on components, frankly, the focus should be on value addition because that is where, frankly, the big money lies. You know, what kind of value addition in terms of systems, in terms of understanding, in terms of optimization you can bring to the table. Uh, so, and uh, either have to draw upon your legacy understanding of thermal components, for example, let me focus on that. Because if you have an understanding of thermal components, that is where your strength lies and that is a value addition a, uh, a supplier can bring in. Another uh, trend which we are sort of observing is that uh, suppliers coming together who have maybe uh, expertise in varied disciplines. Uh, to give you an example, for example, uh, two suppliers who have uh, have expertise in say power electronics and one has it has with motor, rather than supplying components separately, they join up together and uh, look at an integrated product uh, because uh, marrying their expertise and approach the supply chain from that perspective, that would be key uh, uh, to the entire game over here. Uh, I, I just give you a sort of an, an understanding. We did a we did a, a, a study of ten OEMs uh, and observed their sourcing strategy for a component uh, for the EXL component. You know, and uh, what what emerged was very interesting. Now, in 2020, if we look at it, uh, 70 percent of the EXL production was uh, being outsourced. You know, the OEMs are sourcing it from ex externally, and only 30 percent was in house. And the scenario is expected to flip completely by 2030. So that is what the suppliers are up against. So it's, that's, that's, an, that's so an interesting trend. That's an interesting trend. And because this is the global trend, but uh, I don't see, you know, the Indian Indian scenario playing out very differently. So very different. And of course, and uh, along with the, the, um, the, the various disruptions, uh, including electric mobility, there's also this increasing trend of collaboration, collaboration yep. between among uh, OEMs and you know, possibly, uh, and also between uh, or between suppliers. So I think uh, in all likelihood, it will only uh, gather more steam in the coming years. Uh, so uh, nice, uh, we had enjoyed this conversation with you, Suraj, uh, but uh, last question, um, does IHS market uh, see India as being among in, in, the, in the top rung of uh, countries when it comes to uh, in the EV industry volumes? in the near future? It's a very difficult question, actually. And as I said, uh, I wouldn't be the right person to comment on it. But let me just say that, you know, the future looks bright. It, it's, uh, it's uh, we are not as dark in the dark as say a few years ago when, uh, you know, there was a lot of questions around e-mobility on whether to take the plunge or not to take the plunge. But, uh, you know, the current volumes are not there. It might not reflect, but as our numbers show, there is a very, encouraging growth projected uh, for battery electric vehicles. And frankly, today, uh, be it on an OEM or a supplier, sitting on the fence is not going to pay off, you know, uh, because by the time you decide to take, make that move, the technology will have to move forward that, that much. And considering that there are a lot of new players as well as legacy players over there, it's, it's a very fluid uh, market. So you have to jump into the game, unfortunately, yeah. Even right, and and I would agree with you. Uh, the number of fence sitters is, is uh, on the decline, you know, yeah, as, yeah. as as the the electric electrification megatrend gathers steam and more traction. In, the key uh, would be risk management, in. as we yeah. Sorry, the key would be the risk management, as we said. You know, uh, yeah. joint ventures, uh, partner technical partnerships. That that we see that happening globally, and I don't. Uh, I, that's a good strategy to have in India as well. Indeed, indeed. And uh, so uh, on that note, uh, Suraj, uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this uh, conversation with uh, uh, Suraj Shetty, Principal uh, Research Analyst in the Automotive Supply Chain at and Technology Team at IHS Market. So on that note, uh, thank you very much, Suraj, and thanks all the uh, all our viewers for watching this conversation. And take care and be safe.